No part of this lecture material may be used without the express written consent of Rick Ramos or Contra Costa College. Uh, this is Professor Rick Ramos and we're in the uh, Legal Aspects of Evidence lecture series. Today's topic is Methods of Identification. When you are responding to a call, and let me give you an, an idea, have a rape case and the suspect description is pretty unique. Let's say we're looking for a white male, blonde hair. He's about six foot two. He's wearing a white t-shirt, blue jeans with a red baseball cap. And you contemporaneous the crime. So within a certain amount of time that, that the suspect would still logically be in the area, you make a stop on the suspect. And at that point, <clears throat> you go back and you get your victim and we do what's called an infield show up. Infield show up involves a balancing of the interest and fairness to the criminally accused persons and prompt, proper and efficient law enforcement. The choice has uh, primarily been made to permit the infield identification because the immediate knowledge whether or not the correct person has been apprehended is of overriding importance and the service to law enforcement, the public, and the criminal himself. And this is People versus Odom in 1980. The definition of an infield show up is an infield show up is a one on one viewing of a suspect by a victim or witness in the field shortly after the commission of a crime for identification purposes. There are two purposes for the identification show up, the infield show up. It is a reliable means of identification to quickly identify criminal suspects shortly after a commission of a crime. And number two, it is a reliable means to quickly exonerate innocent persons from further suspicion or inconvenience. So what are the legal elements? I already gave you one. It's got to be contemporaneous to the crime, close in time and proximity to the crime. Examples. Permissible to detain a robbery suspect for 10 minutes in the back of a patrol car while the victim was transported to the scene. Uh, again, you know, when we're looking at these, the, the, the seriousness and scope of the investigation, a judge is going to allow more time. Let's say that in that rate case that I just talked about earlier. We have three suspects and they're spread out and it's going to take us about 30 minutes to be able to go from suspect to suspect and let the victim look at the suspect. That would be reasonable. That would be reasonable. But to hold somebody there for two hours before you bring the uh, victim to ID would not be reasonable. Yeah, other examples, identification of a suspect 20 minutes minutes after commission of crime was permissible in People versus York. Identification of two female impersonated robbery suspects for certain person snatch who were handcuffed to a guardrail within 25 minutes after the crime was permissible. In People versus Wynn, a 94 case, transportation of a robbery victim to a home several hours after a crime where matching suspects had been detained for an unrelated robbery was upheld. People vs. Edwards, 1981, a rape victim identified a suspect who was on a gurney in a hospital four hours after the commission of the crime. An admonishment was given and the identification was still permissible despite the time lapse. This is a long one now. A rape and multiple sex crime victim identified a suspect detained on the street the following day, that's 20 plus hours later, and the appellate court ruled that the totality of circumstances the promptness of an in-field show up was necessary. There was a need for on-site confrontation versus a physical lineup to exclude an innocent person from unnecessary suspicion. Note, the case law authority extends time for in-field show ups detailed with serious felonies and takes place within the same investigative day, so 24 hours. The next rule that we have to deal with is avoiding the element of suggestiveness. And the case law says that it's a prosecution's burden of proof to show that the identification transaction was not so suggestive as to give rise to substantial likelihood of irreparable misidentification in court. Case law recognizes the one-on-one -on -one suspect identification. Essentially, when a suspect is detained by police, can carry an element of suggestiveness. So it's really important that you admonish the person. And typically, the way that I would do it is I would say that just because the police have someone stopped does not mean that that's the person who committed the crime against you. So I want you to look at the person. I want you to tell me, is it the person? Is it not the person? 
or are you not sure? And because I'm going to use that totality of circumstances with evidence that I might find on them or property from the, you know, fruits of the crime, instrumentality, contraband, or other evidence to determine whether I have probable cause to make an arrest. I just need to know from the victim if they can ID or not, but I don't want them identifying the wrong person. The other thing that has to happen is officers have to be in control of ident the identification transaction. That means if you've got multiple victims and witnesses, separate them. Don't let one person influence another. If you have grandma who can't see a lick, can't see 20 feet, and you have junior who's 12, and he says he saw something, and she says she saw something that doesn't match up, don't let her influence him. He may be the best witness. So it's important to separate them out. Obtain and record detailed descriptions of the suspect prior to them being viewed. The goal is to show the descriptions obtained before the, the show up were very similar to that of the detained arrested suspect. In other words, you're trying to match up what your radio call, what dispatch put out, etc. If the victims and witnesses involved, they need to be separate, separately identify the suspect. Don't have them all go, oh yeah, that's him, oh yeah, that's him. That's not going to work. Be careful on what you say to the victim and witness prior to them making the identification. Don't say things like, we got the guy, we arrested the suspect, we need you to come and make an identification. Don't say that. Say what I said earlier. Don't do things or show things that show, uh, you know, consciousness of guilt on the part of the defendant. I mean, don't display any of the fruits of the crime instrumentality. You know, you got the gun and the mask and all that on the trunk when they're coming by to identify them. Have them do it solely on their viewing. If the identification is made, is made, don't confirm the results either verbally or through facial expression or body language. They got to be independent on what they do. You know, don't go like, oh, my God. You know, shake your head no, because then they go, oh, no, no, yeah, that is him. That's not what you want. You want to know what's going on. If the suspect's arrested, take a full-length color photograph at booking. It should show their stature, you know, their height, their weight, clothing, trappings, as well as other facial characteristics. You need to be able to recreate what was seen that night by the victim. So things like hats, shirts, necklaces, rings, other items that are unique to the person, tattoos, scars, anything that's going to really be important. So again, important to admonish a victim or witness that you're under no obligation to make an identification that um, just because we have the person stopped or handcuffed or whatever doesn't mean anything. It may not be the right person. And do you think this is the person? Do you not think this is the person? Or are you not sure? And then why? Have them say why. Well, that's because he's wearing the, the jacket. That's He had a ripped shirt or whatever, something that makes it um, unique. Remember that if you have not told the person they're under arrest and you're just stopping them for a field show up, that uh, Miranda doesn't apply, you can ask some questions. You can also, in some instances, transport the suspect if the victim's incapacitated. In a gang rape, rape of a victim who was undergoing medical um, examination, forensic evidence collection, that that's deemed to be incapacitated at the hospital, the two detained suspects could be handcuffed and transported to the hospital for an infield show up. And that's a case out of 1990. The general rule is if you don't have an incapacitated victim, like they're laying on their back at the hospital on a stretcher, um, you are going to be required to transport the victim or witness back to the scene for identification if you only have the person contacted or detained and they're not yet arrested. The exceptions are, of course, if the suspect volunteers to uh, go back and, and stand in a uh, field show up. Your textbook is going to give a number of examples about incapacitated uh, victims. For the purposes of your police report, make sure that you note the time of day the observation occurred and if it's nighttime, the lighting conditions and record relevant weather conditions. Also, the distance of the view, the angle of the view, any buildings or obstructions that may be blocking the view, the opportunity to view the crime, including the length of time involved in the observation, the degree of attention to the victim, witness, length of time between the observation and identification transaction, the competency or credibility factors involved in the victim witness, including eyesight, emotional state, sobriety, you know, whether they're drunk or not. The accuracy of the witness description of the suspect and certainty of the identification include, and include discrepancies of statements 
and that will really tighten up your, your investigative case and give you something to fall back on later on when you have to remember what happened. The other way that we identify people if it's after the fact, not necessarily an infield lineup, is by a photo lineup. A photo lineup is an array of similar photographs, including the suspect shown to the victim or witnesses for identification purposes. We have to be careful. The general standard is that we show a six pack, meaning six photos, including the suspect, and it can't be pre prejudicial. If we're looking at African Americans, they have different complexions. You can't have a super blue black, you know, male in the middle and everybody else is light complected, and that's your suspect. That would get thrown out. You need to look for similar hair, similar face. Um, you want them to be the same age, approximately. You don't want to have your suspect being 50 and all of the, the uh, what we call the plug-ins or the stand-ins are, you know, 20 years old. That will also get you in trouble. So you have to be fair in how you put that together. A single Photoshop doesn't necessarily invalidate later in court identification as long as no suggestive remarks are made. Now, I had a case where the Till 2 on Shattuck Avenue, <clears throat> south of Alcatraz, there was a murder of a guy named Roosevelt Brown. And uh, the two suspects were uh, both black girl family members out of Berkeley. And I knew them well because they're both big guys. They're both over 6'5", 300 pounds, all muscle. And uh, one of the witnesses said, yeah, I saw Virgil and, and uh, Melvin. And I went, oh, Virgil Luckett, Melvin McCullough. And I happened to always carry it as a sergeant on night shift their photos in my pocket because they were just, you know, out there doing crimes all the time. So I pulled out the photos and showed him. He goes, that's them. Now, in that case... He had known them, so it wasn't like it was a stranger, and he was just validating that later in court the judge said that was fine. The last thing I want to tell you is you should not have the suspect's names. You should have photos, and there's ways of doing this digitally through criminal information, uh, data banks, or driver's license photos. You don't want to have identifying info on there. It just should say number one, number two, number three, number four, number five, number six with their photo. The other thing is you want to admonish them just like you did before that I'm showing you these pictures doesn't mean the suspects in here I need you to look at that I need you to tell me if it's if you see the suspect if you don't see the suspect if you're not sure and then why if you're you know validating it either way really important but uh, again be sure that you're fair about the fillers that you pick because it can't be prejudicial it'll be thrown out because you're going to book that into evidence and the judge is going to look at it Jury's going to look at it. The, the DA will even look at it and tell you it wasn't a good ID if you uh, are prejudicial on how you put together your fillers. The next topic is physical lineups. And a physical lineup involves the stage personal viewing of similar persons, including a suspect, by witnesses or victims for the purposes of identification. This is a live lineup transaction, and usually you have everybody wearing similar clothes or they're all wearing. Um, jail turnouts, so they all look the same. And uh, you can have them wear certain clothing, if that's the thing that you're gonna need to do, or say certain words, this is a robbery. This is a robbery. This is a robbery. This is a robbery. You know, you're looking at the voice inflection, trying to pick that out. And also be aware that's not a Fifth Amendment violation because they're not, they're only saying it for the purposes of voice inflection, timber, you know, how they speak, volume, etc., not for the purposes of truthfulness in the statement. The Again, you need to put together a fair uh, lineup with fillers who are similar. Right to counsel, uh, issues are there. The key difference between f physical uh, lineups and infield showups and, and photographic lineups is that the defendant has a Sixth Amendment right to be represented by counsel. A conviction was overturned because the counsel was neither notified nor present during a physical lineup. And that's a 94 case Myers. The defendant can waive the right to counsel if he or she is informed of the right to have counsel present during the lineup and that the counsel was appointed at no charge. That's a Wade case in 67. The right to counsel doesn't attach to interviewing witnesses and victims before or after the physical lineup transaction. That's Perkins in 86. Same rules apply. You've got to eliminate the element of suggestiveness. You have to Basically, uh, let them make the choice. Don't be suggestive. Other identification resources. We always usually have a mug book that has the recidivist offenders that are in the area. And you can have people look through there. You have sex offenders who are listed. Drug uh, offenders who are reporting are listed. We 
We also use Identikit or Kongfu Sketch, which is computer software to build a face and try to identify a suspect. And we distribute it for South stop detention and arrest later. We have things called uh, John Doe warrants for the arrest of someone, particularly if you do a DNA analysis and you have a match. To stop the statute of limitations on the case, you can issue a complaint under John Doe with that certain DNA match because if that person gets arrested later on, we'll get the DNA match as part of their booking uh, or conviction on another crime, and then we're able to go after, after them and find them. We use artist con uh, conceptions where artists sit down and, and uh, will um, put together a drawing. We can use uh, cameras from, let's say, retail stores or private or public cameras to identify suspects. Uh, they have to be, you know, basically, you have to maintain the chain of evidence with the videotape. You need to be able to establish the time and date that it was taken. They also have voice lineups that are arranged in a similar manner to the photographic lineup, except the voice exemplar substitute uh, for photos. You'd have the person listen to the voice. Victim of forcible rape, sodomy, and oral copulation was able to identify the defendant's tape voice from amongst those of five other voices with Hispanic accents. This is in mode. And remember that when you're trying to get the voice exemplar, there was no one who right to refuse to speak the voice exemplar because the evidence is not testimony. That's the end of this uh, chapter on methods of identification. 